So hello, Anna. I'm really uh, happy to have you here at uh, my YouTube channel. And we're going to talk about uh, stem cell based therapies and how to maximize their impact. So I'm really happy to have you here. So how are you? Thank you. Very nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Yes. Yeah, so coming to this agile interview, uh, I would be very uh, happy if you could uh, please uh, tell us um, about your actually change, personal change, which you make or career change, which you make from uh, European um, medicine agency to academia. And um, for me, you are standing here already with your change mindset since you made such transition and you are back in academia after 20 years working at EMA. So I would be really happy to uh, hear why did you decide to make such transition from EMA to academia after 20 years? Thank you. Um, first, 20 years is a long time. So it's, um, it's, it's a good thing to do to change occasionally. It, it took me a long time because working in EMA is wonderful. It's a, it's a great organization and you do very, very special job. There are a few places in the world. So it was not that I wasn't happy with my situation there, but I think it was very connected to the fact that the last five years, I was really working with advanced therapies. So this is the umbrella term that has the stem cell research and therapies, but also the gene editing and the tissue engineering products. So mm -hmm. it, they're a special type of products. And I found that the traditional way of developing medicines did not really fit these new revolutionary medicines that well. So I found myself with a lot of interaction back with academic developers in universities, hospital clinics. And it was very clear that uh, there was not an as natural partnership as the traditional partnership with these regulators with industry, because that is tested, and proven to work very, very well. Mm -hmm. And that works very well for most medicines, all the chemicals and even the complex biologicals. But ATMPs are a different animal. So after interacting with academic developers, it, it was an easy step to decide to move to the other side and mm -hmm. to see how can I help? Because the objective here is translation, is to make sure yeah. that a lot of this wonderful research end up being medicines in the patients that need them. So it was a little bit of a continuation of the work, but from a completely different side. And uh, I'm enjoying it enormously. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. And we only remind to uh, some of you which don't know about ATMPs, uh, these are actually including stem cell based products. So they are actually uh, are standing for advanced therapy medicinal products. So uh, these mm -hmm. are not only stem cells because we're focusing here on stem cells, but this also gene based products or tissue. Um, based products. So that's maybe something important to, uh, to, um, uh, to um, explain. So thanks, Anna, about your personal now insight for this transition. And now we'll move forward to uh, the second question, uh, which uh, comes back when I uh, first time met you at a Tech Talk event, uh, 28th of September, which was organized Leiden Bioscience Park. And listening to your great presentation, I got very strong, strong impression of you as a very purpose-driven and inspirational speaker. And your purpose was uh, then, and I think I also think now, is to still maximize this translation impact of stem cell-based therapies. So um, to achieve this, of course, identifying challenges in this process is very important. So um, I wonder if you could please share with us, and I know that it can be challenging itself, uh, top three challenges uh, you have in mind here. Uh, okay, the, the thing that worries me more at the moment is that we are in the middle of the review of the pharma legislation. So there's a proposal from the commission, it will be debated in parliament, it will be voted, and in a few years we will have a new pharma legislation. And when you look at these um, stem cells or the other advanced therapies, we are a minority in numbers at the moment because the numbers of approved new drugs if in Europe there will be 80 to 100, the number of advanced therapies approved will be very small, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. So the risk is here that we are going to do some legislation changes that will apply to the majority of the medicines. But we know that these medicines are the future. 
they promise to do things in a different way, in a way that they will transform the lives of people. So instead of having a lot of chronic or incurable diseases with few medicines every day, then we can have this one-off intervention to potentially cure somebody. So we are talking about a different game, but it's the game of the future. So my main worry at the moment is that the legislation will play to the majority rather than to the ones who are very different and will be very important in the future. So it's all of us now, we need to be watching for that and interact in all the consultations and the opportunities and talk with decision makers, not just with, um, with the industry, but also with politicians to make sure that the new legislation is fit for advanced therapies. Mm -hmm. That's not one, you asked me for three, okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> I also am very hopeful about the real world evidence side of things because the amount of uncertainty when you approve one of these very new therapies is very high because the changes are forever. Think like when you are doing some genome editing, that's forever for that person. You cannot stop the medication and go back to how you were before. So um, there is a lot of risk in these therapies. So the real world evidence and all these wonderful developments now with artificial mm -hmm. intelligence and all this data handling, is a very, very powerful tool for advanced medicines. And not just for controlling the pharmacovigilance, the safety post authorization, which is super important, but also to see how efficacious they are in the long term, how long is the lasting effect, even at the beginning to use, for example, natural history for rare diseases that they don't have uh, enough patients to be doing some comparison. So that's the second thing. It's not a worry, it's a hope and a tool. And I really hope in the next few years it will, it will come good. The third concern or the challenge has to be manufacturing. These drugs are so difficult to make and to make well. And the amount of evidence and the type of evidence that you need for regulatory decision making also needs to comply with the needs of the HTAs and the payers and the reimbursements and all the money part of the therapies. So we really need to look into these manufacturing areas and improve it and maximize it and use the data really well. And at the moment, that's one of the most, most difficult things that we have in our hands. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think this really brings us from different taking also this challenges from different perspectives, which you already brought now here. Um, so the third question is uh, diving more into a situation where we have most of ATMPs, so including stem cell based products originating or developing first in academia. So coming from the academic research. And we know that as academic scientists, uh, we uh, are focused on first uh, delivering in vitro data, right? Then following this data followed by developing translational model using animals. Uh, and, and that's where, where our preclinical research is in a way focused on. Um, but there is regarding clinical data and clinical uh, trials, a lot of discrepancies between the preclinical data so academic data, uh, research data, and clinical data. And uh, to avoid these discrepancies, I would like to ask you how academic scientists uh, can or should design and, and perform the initial preclinical research so that this research, you know, data obtained from research can serve actually to develop successfully uh, clinical trials. And are the data as a sub question, as a, or are the data obtained from animal models truly useful to develop the clinical uh, trials? Okay, this is a very difficult question and there is not a yes or no answer, but um, two or three things to consider. The first one is that for these therapies, they are so complex. And in a lot of cases, you are talking about a small number of patients because most of them, at least at the moment, are for orphan drugs. Um, you really need to consider that everything that you are doing in the lab will produce data that will end up on the table with the regulators. So that doesn't apply to the more chemical or the traditional developments where you can play a lot in the lab and you will be producing an idea and a drug and then 
the feather developer, normally a, a pharma company, will do all the testing required to produce all the evidence. Here, again, it's a different game. So mm -hmm. anything that you are doing now, think about it as something will be will be considered when this drug is going to be approved, it's going to be assessed for a for marketing approval. So that puts a different um, angle on everything that you do. Then the consistency and the reproducibility and the be able to do, you know, analyze every batch in a very consistent way. And what is the relevant information that you want to take? Because you can test a hundred things which are just not going to be relevant later on. So this idea of start from the patients and it started to count backwards of the type and the amount of evidence that you need to produce mm -hmm. and consider that everything that you're producing will be looked at. So um, it's a little bit of a change of environment from academics. Academics love to tinkle and to improve all the time. That's not necessarily good. Uh, that's, Part of basic research is tinkering and doing different things. That should continue. Absolutely should continue. But mm -hmm. if you are in the game of translation, if you want to develop a medicine that will end up in a patient, mm -hmm. then you need to change the frame of mind to make sure that you need to set your sights on what you want to do and then test it properly in a way that the information is consistent and you're comparing apples with apples and not apples with pears. That's a slightly different frame of mind for academic research. And you are absolutely right that the soul of this research is in academia, universities, hospital, clinics, um, research institutions. So we are talking here about basically in Europe, taxpayer money based research or very small outfits, the SMEs, the, the small biotechs or the companies who are a flip from something that originated in university. So it's a different environment and one that need to put really the translation hat on from the very, very early development. Yeah. But you also asked me about the animals. Yes, animals, yes. Yeah, this is not a straight, a straight um, situation because as a rule, the animal models have much less usefulness for advanced therapies that they do with traditional. So they, all the safety and toxicology that you do with other medicines, that doesn't quite apply because they are very complex and very uh, dependent on, on the human body. So if you are going to do the gene editing, yes, you can test a lot in animals, but when you arrive to the production of the evidence that the regulators need, then the validity of the data is much, much less. So the direction of travel, is to reduce the amount of the regulatory evidence produced in animals. That doesn't mean that you can do without to test your models, but that the fact is that the, the evidence produced by those animal studies, they are not always that relevant. And also you know, the FDA also produced a document recently saying animal experiments are not always necessary for advanced therapy. So the direction of travel is clear. Mm -hmm. Choose your animal models very well, and especially before you go to large animal models or to large numbers, check that the evidence produced is regulatory or HTA needed. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's a very important tip, which you give very concrete now, especially for the ones which academic scientists which have this ambition to to you know go beyond preclinical uh, research and develop product and bring it into. Clinic, uh, clinical therapies and make this therapies truly successful because that's what we really want, right? Successful mm -hmm. for patients. So, uh, Anna, I think uh, thank you very much for this very insightful answers, I think, to all my three questions uh, in this agile, uh, time efficient interview. I'm really happy that we are really on time, <laughs> 15 minutes. And I'm, I'm really also would, what I would like to, I hope you also agree with me that this is, of course, has to be done in very collaborative um, uh, um, uh, setting so that not only academic scientists are participating mainly at the um, at development of this product, but also that there is strong, more stronger collaborative impact. So collaborations, more collaboration, tight collaborations between academia and industry. Absolutely, this is a triangle. So the academics are the originators of the ideas, the regulators, 
should look at the evidence before it goes to patients. And industry is fundamental because they have all the know-how. But what I would like to see is that whatever academics do is useful to industry because that's the path to markets. So it's no question of doing it in isolation. It's a question of coming back from the patients and having something that then could be taken forward because it's already pointing in the right direction, which is the translation direction. Yes, exactly. So thanks a lot. And uh, I was really happy to have you on my channel.